my utmost <laughs> for his highest. I used to think that I was going to write a devotional, and I, who knows, I have so many writing projects, maybe someday I'll get to it, but it was called My Uttermost for His Utmost. Yeah, and the whole theme of it was simply using what you got to give the best that you can with all that you have so that he would be blessed with what you have and possess. Because in my mind's eye, the little that you have is more important than the best that sometimes people go way out of their way to get, you know, like musicians have to have the better guitar or the better sound system or whatever. No, you don't. <laughs> Not really. Or they got to have some, you know, marvelous new, you know, ear pick, you know, so they could hear themselves better. No, you don't. <laughs> Not really. You know, as a matter of fact, Keith Green was probably one of the most dynamic um, worship leaders you could imagine. And, you know, no one would doubt that the Holy Spirit was there whenever Keith Green played. And he would take his professionalism, you know, to the studio and couldn't cut an album that sounded half as good as when he was just simply worshiping the Lord on old beaten piano. So, giving all that that piano had and all that he was to the Lord at those moments, there were things that he did that are just to this day still outrageously, undeniably, unquestionably, totally full of God in it. And, you know, it, I, I grin thinking about it because it just would not go over in modern world today because as much as we have our certain worship leaders that, you know, unquestionably cause them to, at the height of their success, step back and say, well, I just want to get to the heart of worship, you know, and but then they go and record an album, you know, and they got to sell it and, you know, market it and do everything else. So at some point in time, you know, the lifestyle's got to, you know, match up with the words or, you know, whatever you want to call it. And sometimes I think that Christendom has gone on the wrong track, you know, and that we made gods of men out of gods of Christendom. And that somehow we have all our little gods in a row instead of just the one thing that is needful. And that's you and me or a man, or a woman, or a worship leader, or a person to just simply get alone with God, get real, and spend some quality time with Him, and let Him direct. I'm not so sure that He wanted to create all these little kingdoms we have in Christianity. Maybe you're confident. I'm not. Acquaintance with grief. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We are not acquainted with grief in the way in which our Lord was acquainted with it. We endure it, we get through it, but we do not become intimate with it. At the beginning of life, we do not reconcile ourselves to the fact of sin. We take a rational view of life and say that a man by controlling his instincts and by educating himself can produce a life which will slowly evolve into the life of God. Uh-uh. But as we go on, we find that the presence of something which we have not taken into consideration, meaning sin, and it upsets all our calculations. <laughs> yeah. Sin has made the basis of things wild and not rational. You just can't stop it. <laughs> we have to recognize that sin is a fact, not a defect. Sin is a red-handed mutiny against God. Either God or sin must die in myself. The New Testament brings us right down to this one issue. If sin rules in me, God's life in me will be killed. If God rules in me, sin in me will be killed. There is no possible ultimate than that. The climax of sin is that it crucified Jesus Christ. And what was true in the history of God on earth will be true in your history and in mine. We must be crucified with Christ. In our mental outlook, we have to reconcile ourselves to the fact of sin as the only explanation as to why Jesus Christ came and as the explanation of the grief and sorrow in life. I think the greatest testimony that anyone could ever give and share isn't the beautiful Jesus that everyone makes a portrait of, but the disgusting, torn-up flesh of the Son of God that exists in heaven right now, that his face marred beyond any man, that his beard plucked out, 
that he looks not like some beautiful caricature of the Son of God, but that he looks like a lamb slain before the foundations of the world. And that every single individual that comes before the Son of God, the Son of Man, and stands before him as he brings him to himself, and he stands there, will fall down on the knee and declare that he is the Son of God to the glory of God the Father. And that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, because just looking at that destroyed image of a man, that devastated body that is the love of God, epitomized in the actions of which he did for us, will tear us down not just to our knees, but to our face, as we fall before God, and we are undone. That is love. But that is sin. And it is what you, and it is what I, did to God. We will see the effects of our personal sins on the Son of God, the Son of Man, throughout eternity and it will remind us and it will be a living testimony to what Jesus did for you to what Jesus did for me that is the sorrow and grief he talks about if you're not sorrowful over the very image of the reality of knowing for a fact that God himself is going to have the only imperfect person in the universe, which is his own son, there for our sin. If that doesn't bring sorrow and grief, I don't know what will. But I know that when you stand before the Son of God, he will see to you and you will see him as a lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world. And it won't be pretty. And sin isn't. The effects of sin, will ramif the ramifications of it will exist throughout eternity. Even as those who deny the salvation that they were offered free, they will exist in eternity for a testimony of the judgment of God that they have rejected the price that Jesus paid. And right there in that very marred body and flesh of blood that every single soul will see, they will know why throughout eternity they are forbidden from being in heaven. And there is a lake of fire where they will exist eternally punished for the effects of sin on the Son of God, the Son of Man, my Lord, my Savior, your God, your Savior. That is why we are sorrowful. That is why we would grieve. And that is the purpose with which God sent His only begotten Son, that you should know what sin costs and what price He paid for you. And for me, when I sin, it grieves me, as it does God, as it does the Holy Spirit, and as it does Jesus.